Welcome to our Thursdays with Noma. Uh, before we begin tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Noma's art stroll coordinator, Martin Collins, who has a special statement to share with us tonight. Martin, you're up. Thank you, Neria. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Thursdays with Noma. Our sponsor tonight is situated just steps away from the Seaman Drake Arch, the Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room at 5057 Broadway and West 216th Street provides great wine and spirits from around the world. Free delivery, outstanding customer service by the owner, Norberto Duran. For over 10 years, Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room has offered wines from all respective regions of the old and new world, and they aim to enhance your shopping experience with service that pairs your selections of food or simply to entertain family and friends. Their mission is to provide a welcoming space for everyone to discover and explore wines and spirits. You should check out their website, InwoodHillsWines.com. Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room takes great pride in their hand-picked selections with an emphasis on quality and value. They're a proud supporter of the Uptown Art Stroll and the arts community. And the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance thanks Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room and the owner, Norberto Duran, for sponsoring Thursdays with Noma and Nadima Agod. Nerea, back to you. Thank you so much, Martin. And thank you to Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room for your support tonight. Good evening to all of you. It's so great to be back tonight for our second show in our Fall Thursdays with Noma series. My name is Neria Leva Gutierrez and I'm the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their support of this program. As I mentioned last week, Thursdays with Noma and its earlier iterations, Stay at Home Open Studios were born during the city's lockdown and the COVID pandemic. But though they emerged during our isolation, they remain part of our programming. Indeed, we have learned that these evenings have tremendous value in bringing us together and in providing wonderful opportunities for us to get to know one, one another in a dynamic and yes, fairly intimate, be it virtual setting. And as you know, for those of you who have joined us week after week or even on occasion, this program is indeed an opportunity to get to know our amazing uptown artists. It's an opportunity to learn something new or unexpected about these artists, and it's especially a chance for all of you to ask questions and engage in conversation with our featured artists. So, Please, as always, we encourage you to ask your questions in the chat and we will be sure to give you a chance to ask them directly. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's featured artists. Nadima Agard, Cherokee Lakota, Powhatan is an artist, illustrator, curator, educator, lecturer, storyteller, writer, poet, published artist, museum professional, and consultant in repatriation and multicultural Native American arts and culture. She earned a BS in art education from NYU and an MA in art and education from Columbia University's Teacher College, and she continued her studies in Italy and Greece. Her work spans four decades and includes multiple solo exhibitions, group exhibitions, including Noma's Women in the Heights exhibition and guest curatorships across the country. Her expansive and expansive Impressive work in museums includes serving as an art educator for the Museum of the American Indian, where she earned a prestigious National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, which resulted in the publication of her Southeastern Native Arts Directory for Bemidji State University in Minnesota, where she also served as an adjunct professor of studio arts and education. As a Powhatan, she has focused on issues related to the Algonquin Nation's arts and cultures, and since 9-11 has served as a guest curator for three important exhibitions. Lady Liberty as a Native American icon, an artistic perspective, Lady Liberty as a Native American icon, and from Manhattan to Manate. A self-described bridge between urban and traditional Native cultures, Nadima is currently director of Red Earth Studio Consulting Productions, based in New York City, where she tirelessly advocates for contemporary Native arts and cultures. She is also an accomplished children's book illustrator and author, having extensively published with her Cherokee name, which is translated as Red Earth. 
Among her works are those included in Earth Songs, Moon Dreams, paintings by American Indian women, The American West, The Modern Vision, Fire in the Womb, Mothers in Creativity, and Voices of Color, Art, and Society in the Americas. Most recently, she published Shane, a phonics book for children which profiles an Algonquin Nation boy of the Great Lakes Woodlands. As a visual artist, she has exhibited widely in galleries and museums across the nation. Most recently, she was profiled in David Boone Martin's No Reservations, New York Contemporary Native American Arts Movement. Describing her work, Nadima states that, quote, her work as an artist has an individual style and a cosmic subject. It has a global agenda from an indigenous perspective. It is the interconnection of me as a woman, mother, native person, spiritual being, and warrior. It is inspired by the image and cosmologies from Native American traditions of the Southwest, the Plains, Mesoamerica, and the Southeastern and Great Lakes woodlands. Indeed, at the core of Nadima's body of work are the elements of sacred feminine iconography and spirituality. Recognizing that Native people have always respected the feminine creative power, so too does Nadima in her work, thus creating devotional pieces in homage to the earth, sky, moon, and stars. Indeed, all of the creative and regenerative forces of the universe. We are thrilled to have Nadim with us here tonight. It's an honor to hear about her work, her vision, her explorations into the divine feminine and spirituality. Nadima, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. And Nidia, I just want to say that's the best bio I ever heard in my life. And I want a copy of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I have been making art since I was a child. And then I went to the High School of Music and Art, and then I went to uh, uh, NYU for art education. And actually, I noticed that one of our visitors is Michael Sullivan, who was one of my classmates at NYU, class of 1970. I'm so thrilled to see him. Anyway. Can you, can you um, see me? Yeah, I can see you. I saw you I earlier. Know, I don't know how to make everybody show up. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, there's a magic button here. So, um, <laughs> um, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. I know what I look like. Yeah. Okay. But I saw you. Okay. Good to see yeah. you, Michael. Yeah. Good to see you after all these years. Yeah. I was a model for Michael when he, he was making yeah, you films. were in my movie. You were in a movie that I did for the yes. Belgian royal film festival yeah and um i remember everything was in, we were dressed in black and white and then the subject was color uh-huh the lady would be proud <laughs> show a little montage of my work Okay, is this going to be um, like uh, continuous or are we going to stop and talk about each piece? I think we want to hear a little bit about the work. Okay. Thanks. This is one of my first box pieces because I was, a, you know, I painted on canvas, uh, usually canvas that was hung on the wall and most traditional format of, of, of creating art. And then I was invited to this show. It was women of color in the arts. And it was all women of color who were gonna do this show. This work, this work, the title was Box Arts. And the reason why they um, called it Box Arts is it was a, a, a female slang for the, the, the woman's part, body part. And so, you know, it was a breakout piece for me. It was the first time I used three, you know, soft sculpture and 3D, I was always 2D. And then this happened and that, you know, the, the, there's this centerpiece with the corn and the corn is a symbol 
of the male and then within the, the cradle of the female. Uh, so uh, basically it's, it's a relationship that male and female is relational. So one doesn't exist without the other. And then the symbolism, it comes from the Lakota tradition. The Buffalo skull is a sacred symbol. Um, the turtle and the, the, the lizard are, are birth amulets. And my work is not erotic, it's about birth. So um, there are symbols there that have to do with birth and that those are the birth amulets, the, the lizard and the turtle, you're gonna see some more later on. Um, and so and so we're gonna move on to the, the next piece, which was uh, um, Earth Mother and her children of the four directions. And that represents the four colors of humanity, which is coming from the vision of Black Elk, who was a visionary, um, a, a traditional Lakota pra practitioner and a devout Catholic. He lived in the 20th century. He, he had visions. And there's a book called Black Elk Speaks. And that's like, for me, my Lakota Bible. And so I never forgot his vision. And um, here are the, 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 the piece that I, the piece, these, are, these boxes are transformational, as you can see. So that's what they look like as cubes. But what, what they represent is that we're all the children of one mother. We're all the four sacred colors of humanity. The native people don't believe in four races. We only believe in one human race and that we're all different colors. So the symbolism of our work is referencing the, um, the four sacred colors of humanity that represent the native, the Asian, the African, and the Caucasian. And then you can see that. And then um, the next piece, Grandmother Moon and her corn moon daughters. Again, it's the referencing of the relational, the relation between male and female, that it's relational and that you have the, the corn cobs representing the male, but within the, the birth opening of the female. And this piece is called Grandmother Moon and her corn moon daughters. And I did it because at the time I was living in Minnesota and I was attending uh, the, the traditional uh, Midewuin society uh, gatherings and the women used to gather every full moon and we would have a mo full moon ceremony. And the moon is, is grandmother, is Nokomis in the Ojibwe language. And, um, and you know, it, it really inspired me because she's like a slickster, you know, she doesn't, generate that light that she's like reflecting the light of the sun and so um each of these corn moons are her daughters and they represent native caucasian uh, african and, and asian um when i i place things in a, a, a circular manner it's um i always start with the east which is the red and then I go south, which is yellow, west, which is uh, blue or black, and white, which is north. And I always go in a clockwise uh, way because that's our tradition. And then the next piece uh, is called Virgin of Guadalupe's The Corn Mother. And um, I noticed a lot of parallels between the um, the Virgin of Guadalupe that is known in Mexico uh, and, you know, she's, she, before she became the Virgin of Guadalupe, she was Donansi and she was a, uh, a, an Aztec goddess or uh, Mishek, Mishek, uh, Mishek uh, uh, goddess. Cause I know Aztec is the empire, but the people are Mishek. So, um, she was, and she spoke Nahuatl in the story that she appeared. So she was an indigenous goddess. And so I made a parallel between the Virgin of Guadalupe of the Mexica people in Mexico and Selu, the corn mother of 
the Cherokee people who are uh, my mother's people. So that was what this piece was about. Um, it's about four, it's pretty large. It's about five feet uh, by uh, four, three and a half, four feet by five feet. So it's a huge piece and it, it's just, uh, it, it, it represents the sacredness of that birth opening. And because in, in our traditions, that birth opening is a sacred door. And I had a one woman show called Sacred Door. And of course it was the first time this, this piece was shown because we come from the spirit world into this world through that sacred door. So it's a sacred place. And what, what I do as an artist is create art that uh, brings that sense of sacred to that, to that, um, that doorway. And uh, this particular piece um, was done in honor of the West African divinity um, known as Nyemaya, or I say Ocean Mother, Ocean Mother Nyemaya, or Virgin Mary, because in even in the uh, Christian tradition, uh, Mary, Ma, Mare, Maria, Mare has a root word means ocean. So there's this connection with the ocean. And if you attend Catholic ceremonies, often they will take the Virgin in, in the ocean, to the ocean or they'll throw this statue in the ocean. And so there's this connection with the ocean. So I see her as the Virgin Mary, but also as the West African goddess of the, the ocean mother goddess who's in West Africa, the mother of all the divinities. So this is, was uh, inspired by that song, knock, 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 knocking on heaven's door. And um, because that place is the heaven's door. And so those four birds that are going towards the center represent the, the, um, the male spirit. Um, and they also represent almost like um, something that is celestial at the same time. And then there's four phases of the moon represented around the center because the moon has a relationship with the ocean. And this piece is called um, Healing of the Mother. And it has a, I have a very wonderful story about it. Um, it is in the collection of one of my closest friends. Uh, when I was creating this piece, I, I thought about using the sweet grass, which is delineating the form of the yoni or the birth uh, opening. And I had, I didn't have the sweet grass, but I was thinking, I don't know, you know, I want to use the sweet grass, but I don't know, maybe the traditional people might find it a little bit too much for them to handle, you know, because there's the tobacco. And then I had the sage, which is at the top. And then the sweet grass braid is like a braid of, it's a grass. And it, it, it's really important in our ceremonies so I was very, you know, I was kind of like concerned that people might not uh, care for it. So I was sitting in my apartment and I'm thinking, I wonder if I should use this sweet grass. And the doorbell rang and it was one of my women friends who was Anishinaabe or Ojibwe woman from the Minnesota where I was living at the time. She says, I have a gift for you. I said, what is it? She goes, a sweet grass braid. I thought that was quite remarkable that the, that the universe answered my question. I mean, immediately I was like totally blown away. So some of the work, this is a show that just happened. It's called Migration Stories. Uh, it's at Kenkelaba Gallery downtown.
Thank you, Angel. Angelo, that's true. Could you go back to that piece, um, Michelle? These are birth amulet boxes. The one on the left is the female. The blue one represents the knight. And the one on the right, the yellow one represents the male, the birth of a male and also birth. And the yellow one has, um, has a, bur a, a cervical and an umbilical cord surrounding the cervical at the center. And then surrounded by lizards because when babies, uh, Lakota babies are born, their umbilical cords are put into birth amulets. For, for boys, there's lizards and for girls, there's turtles. So the one on the left, which is the female, is got turtle amulets. And on the back of each turtle is the moon, which is a feminine symbol. And surrounded uh, the birth opening is a uh, cowrie shells that uh, women wear on their dresses and which are tri uh, trade uh, items. Um, and it's also a pattern for a dress, a woman's dress, so that the, the head would come through that red area and then the dress would be, uh, the arms would be like the north and south and then the, dr the dress, the front and back of the dress would be east and west. Um, a little bit of uh, whimsy there. So they're called, uh, I'm not finished with that uh, image. Uh, they're called um, blue night, um, turtle, moon, birth amulet of the West, which the West is a direction uh, in the medicine wheel. And we'll talk about that later. And then the yellow day uh, lizard uh, birth amulet, um, of the south and the south is is on the male axis north and south are on the male axis and east and west are on on the um female axis so that's the reason for the colors to relate to the axis uh, there are some images of this as cubes and we'll find them later and then the next piece is aztec virgin mother and this was a piece that I did um, after 9-11. And it represents the, the Virgin of Guadalupe, AKA Don Ancin, uh, the Aztec Virgin Mother and aspects of the, of the Earth Mother Goddess, that she's an Earth Mother Goddess uh, of America. And so, there are certain animals that are affiliated with her. And those animals are um, the butterfly, the rattlesnake, the jaguar, and the, um, could you put it up to the original picture? That's not a box. Okay. Um, there we go. The hummingbird is in the north. The list, the, the rattlesnake is in the south. Then the jaguar is on the east and the butterfly is on the west. Uh, there's a reason why they're on those uh, directions. And there, it's important to say that um, they represent the different categories of life on earth. Uh, of course, the, the insect, the birds, the reptiles, and the mammals. And um, the jaguar has a glass eye. So my son, when I was working on it, he named him Sammy because, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. had a glass eye. So we named him Sammy. But the butterfly kept on falling off. And then he came in one day. He goes, Mom, you know, Sammy never liked that butterfly. It was just funny. Okay, so then um, this next piece is of me standing in front of the moon breast mothers. And this was a piece that was done uh, by me after I had a conversation with this uh, husband of one of the artists that I knew. And he said, you know, you always do 
you always do a uh, birth openings, but what about breasts? And I thought, hmm. And I had, you know, I had really, really avoided the subject of breasts because I was a breast cancer survivor. But then I felt that, gee, I need to really approach that subject. So then I did this Moon Breast Mothers uh, piece. Uh, it's sort of, uh, there's a part that you can't see, but it's it's a butterfly coming out of the, the, the opening, the birth opening with all the stars behind it. And then it, it represents three moon breasts, uh, moon goddesses from three different parts of the world. So I was like in my work, um, I was doing what is spiritual border crossing. You know, I'm a border crosser. And I started, you know, there's the moon goddess of the Greco-Romans, Diana. There's the moon goddess of the Aztecs, Koyoshauki. And there's the moon goddess of the Polynesian people who, whose name is Hina. So I was working on the piece and I said, okay, I know how to represent um, Diana because I had seen a statue of Diana, the moon goddess Diana in, in Ro outside of Rome at Tivoli Gardens. And it was astounding because it was all these, this woman with like 20 breasts. And then there were like water coming out of the nipples and it blew, blew me away at the age of 20. I was totally blown away because America is such a puritanical country, but Italy isn't. And it was so beautiful. It just, it, it just really shocked me. It, it shocked me by, by its beauty. And I never forgot it. So when I depicted Diana, I depicted multiple breasts to represent her. And then there are four phases of the moon depicted in coral because I didn't know how to depict Hina. So I just stopped what I was doing and I went to this Hawaiian film and video festival. And I was sitting there and trying to figure out how am I gonna depict Hina? Maybe somebody here can help me with this. Cause I just, you know, I, my brain was burning. How can I depict Hina? And this woman, they were showing films, but that one day this woman came outside of the, uh, she came out on the stage and she was a doctor, a PhD from University of Hawaii. And I can't pronounce her name, but I knew it started with Liliu. And she says, I'm Dr. Liliu, whatever. And uh, I'm not going to show a film right now. I'm going to talk about Hina. So I just stood there in amazement and I turned my eye, I turned to the left and turned to the right to see if there was anybody behind me because I couldn't believe that she was talking to me and she and Hina was talking through her. And then she said that Hina was coral. And then this in this piece, I depicted Hina in coral uh, around the full moon, the crescent moon, the half moon, the new moon. Um, and, and, you know, I was really, really uh, astounded by that whole thing and how that when you do uh, ask the universe, you'll get the answer. Um, and the next piece uh, is a piece that I did, which was for a show that I was invited to called Wampa Moons of Change. And it was like really important for me to uh, touch base with my Algonquian native people in because the indigenous people of New York City uh, are traditionally Algonquian native. There are many Algonquian native peoples. I mean, Algonquian nations are many, but one of them is the Lenape. And we're in the heart of Lenape country. And um, they did this whole thing with, you know, when 9-11 happened, it was the Algonquian nation like woke up in me and said, okay, because I'm the typical, depicting a lot of my uh, symbolism from my Lakota heritage, but I hadn't really done that much around my Algonquian native history or native uh, heritage. Um, 
I'm Algonquin native on my father's mother's side, but they're from Virginia. Uh, but I'm not a native to New York City, but I'm related to the Algonquian native people that are here because I'm Algonquian native. Um, <clears throat> so I did this piece for a show, it was called Contact one, uh, to, uh, 1609. And uh, it was about Henry Hudson's uh, uh, arrival to uh, what would become New York City. So I worked with symbols that were both Algonquian uh, native and uh, Dutch. And I had a grandmother, my grandmother was Algonquian native and her mother was not native. She was um, European American. And I found, you know, everyone at, at that particular time said she was Dutch and she, her father was Dutch. So that was true. But I later found out she was also English, Welsh, and something else. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so I dedicated this piece to my, my grandmother's parents because her father was uh, Algonquian native and her mother was Dutch American and uh, other European American ancestry. So each piece, uh, the first one is uh, uh, on the top is a Dutch house and then you have the, the squash, and then you have the coin, uh, you have the tobacco, you have the windmill, you have the beans, you have the blue moon with the beaver, the wampum shell, the turtle, the moon, and the corn, and then the name of Henry Hudson's boat. I included the symbolism of the three basic foods of indigenous people of the Northeast woodlands as corn, beans, and squash. And then I included the turtle because of our, our, our story about creation is on the back of a turtle. And then I had the blue moon because once in a blue moon, you know, but the, the, uh, the uh, trade between the Dutch and the indigenous people was, was the beaver. And then I had grandma down on the corner. She was slick, she was surrounded by pearls. And, you know, like I said, grandma's a slickster. So I, I really, um, wanted to give her some pearls and to say that Algonquian native people uh, of, of New York City, uh, the uh, Lenape people, they used to get pearls from Pearl Street and they wore pearls and fur before the hoi polloi of New York High Society. Um, there's a lot of New York tradition that uh, it comes from our Algonquian native uh, peoples. And at the, la at the circle on the bottom is the sweetgrass braid. And that was given to me as a gift by the American Indian Community House. Um, so that was like, wow. And, and it, was the, it was a purple, which is the, I use the purple and white um, um, colors of the wampum shell, which is sacred shell to our Iroquoian and Algonquian people. And Long Island is the, you know, really wampum city out there. And in New England, a lot of wampum is, you know, is created from the shell of the Quahog clan. Next. And this was a, this was a, a piece that I did. Um, it's called Traditionally Global Parflesh Series of, uh, and, and Traditional Global Mother Breast Series. And again, I'm using both the breast image and the birth opening image. And there's a mirror at the openings and all of those, those boxes represent uh, divinities or mothers of the four self sacred colors of humanity. And so when you're looking at this piece, they're all your mother, you know, like when you go to see them, they're all your mother. And then the breast represents the four, divine feminines of, um, of the world, you know, whichever ones you want to, to um, use, but, uh, okay. <laughs> so I, I need to uh, explain that um, a lot of my work has symbolism. And that's really important to my process. So I just don't work. 
I'm not just working with color and shape. I'm working with symbolism and history. So this piece is Warrior Woman Spirit in the in the uh, the uh, Andy Warhol kind of take off take off, and of course I'm representing her in, in the four sacred colors, and it's a self portrait of me uh, back in the day. I did a a full life a full size uh, portrait um, that was life size. So what I did was take a digital image of that and then repeat it. Next. Oh, I just want to say this piece was uh, exhibited at the uh, Statue of Liberty for the Statue of Liberty show called Lady Liberty as a, Na a Native American icon. And it's can, can you keep that piece back in there? Thank you. Uh, it was like um, it's a symbol of sort of making a relationship with the Statue of Liberty. And so we have the the woman holding the fan and in our dances, we call them honor beats when the woman puts her fan up to the drum and goes along with the, the rhythm of the drum, it's called an honor beat. But it just so happens that it's the same, uh, uh, you know, hand that Statue of Liberty holds the torch. So I, I saw that as a correlation and it wasn't planned and I didn't do the work for the Statue of Liberty, but it just turned out that it, kind of represented the Statue of Liberty or my representation. Okay, next. This is a piece I did for a show uh, that was a, a Frida Kahlo show. And, um, and I did uh, represent um, things in Frida's life. I mean, she did think that Diego was the sun, moon, and the stars. So I depicted him as the sun, moon, and the stars above her. And then she had a deer and a pet deer and she had pet parrots. And then below her is the corn, which gives connection with her indigenous roots. And uh, the, the deer is a very important animal to indigenous people. And so is the parrot because we have parrot um, mur murals of parrots in Arizona where there are no parrots. So we know that this parrot you know, came from the South and traveled uh, north to, to Arizona, not the parrot itself, but the tradition of people who had parrots in their tradition. And um, I'm sort of making a connection with, um, and again, she's a, a, she's a, a box piece, she, she's three-dimensional, but uh, I'm making a connection with her indigenous ancestry. Next. Um, I think that we want to get a little dialogue in here. Maria? Yeah, no, I, I, I think um, this is, it's, there's, there's so much. Um, Fortunately, we're, one, we're a one hour show. Yeah, right? no, I, it's amazing <laughs> to me how much, um, how, how much there is to discuss here. One of the, th I, you know, Dima, I was so interested in, in one of the things that you brought up and I think it's so important to discuss. I mean, you talk about how these works about, you know, there's an overwhelming amount of imagery related to women, obviously. Um, and you, you talk about the fact that they're not erotic, you know, which I think is, you know, it's a very Western tradition, right? You're either sort of, you know, an image of beauty and, you know, idealization, or you're erotic. And, you know, you're 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 discussing women from a very multi-dimensional kind of aspect. Can you tell us a little bit more of that? Because I think it's you know we are informed. I think um, you know generally by the the Western tradition, by sort of the East, you know the the Greek Greco-Roman tradition of what women kind of signify, um, and. And what you discuss and your work um, is 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 not about those 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 conventions, right? It's not about beauty. It's not about eroticism. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think it's really, I mean, it really does inform sort of so many aspects of of, of your work. Women in our tradition have a higher status than men because they give birth. My work is about the power of women. Yeah. 
you know, um, the, the women are the backbone of the nation. The women, until the, 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 the they say, until the backs of the women are crushed to the ground, then a nation is defeated, not before. Mm -hmm. Women are powerful in our tradition. The clan mothers were the ones who told the men what to say. So when they went out, they were the orators, but they were, the, they were told what to say. The clan mothers could take away the right of a chief if they found that he was inappropriate. The women had tremendous power and still do have tremendous power in our societies. And it, it's reflective of, and like I said, it's about making that place sacred again because it, our society is out of balance. Our society is sick and we have to balance the male and the female energy so that it's in balance because the, if there's too much female energy, then it's chaotic. And if it's too much male energy, it's too violent. So you have to bring that male and female energy back. And, my, and one of the things that I want to do in my work is to, to bring about a force of balance and harmony and peace. And so the works are visual prayers as well. It's fascinating. It's, it's, you know, it's a recalibration of that, you know, that, that scale, I think that you're talking about. And I think it's so interesting because again, you know, even, you know, if, 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 even if you look back at sort of, you know, Greek tradition where they talk about, you know, man is the measure of all things and they legitimately, legitimately mean men, you know, men are fertility images because they can reproduce and they can reproduce sort of, you know, at will. Um, it's such an it, it's such an interesting and important perspective to kind of address this question of this balance in the universe of of the duality of the masculine and the feminine, um, and I think you know what you what you what you do I think is is to bring to the fore. Um, you know, ancient civilizations who have always privileged the women, you know, not as erotic symbols, not as symbols of beauty, not as symbols of, of purity, but as symbols of, of life, of reproduction, of, of, of fertility, of, of, you know, born of the earth and, and in, in that way, and this sort of regenerative power, which I think is, is so fascinating, you know, um, which was also interesting with this question of, you know, the breast, you know, um, I, I, I think, you know, you, that, how do you then, um, that, and I feel like in a way that question to you, what about the breast, you know, um, is, is almost a very Western question, right? You know, what, what, what do we do with, with the breast? And I think that, um, what you've done with that question, right, is, is to think about it, um, within the context of, of of the ancient civilizations also that you're that you're that you're talking about, um, which is to put it into, you know, to look at the breast through that lens. Um, because for example, in the Western world, you know, the breast is is not necessarily a symbol of fertility. You know, it's a symbol of beauty, it's a symbol of youth, it's a symbol of um you know, and in, in non-Western cultures, um, you know, the, the pendulous breast, the breast that, you know, has given, uh, sort of has nurtured civilizations, you know, that, that is, that is considered the, the ideal. So I, I really, I, I, I find um, your examination of those issues and your, just, you know, um, in your work to be, so important and 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 so so fascinating, especially against the backdrop, I think, of of what our Western conventions have dictated. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about what your you know outside of your own cultural influences? Um, what have been some of your artistic influences, or or that you've embraced or rejected, or or 
you know, what is your relationship with sort of the canon, I guess, of the history of art? Well, you know, I, I, I started out uh, studying about Western art, but after a while, I felt it was restrain it was constricting and restraining. And I remember being a graduate student at Teachers College Columbia, and the teacher would tell me to tone down my colors, you know. And um, so I, because first of all, people, uh, indigenous people, and other people of non-Western cultures don't always make art for the same reasons that people in Western Europe make art. They make art for different reasons. So uh, what I, what I, uh, I, my foundation was Western European art. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went to, I studied in, in, I went to school in, you know, in Rome and I went to school in, in Greece and I studied uh, the Western um, canon, but it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't jive with where I was coming from, you know? And so um, I just made that departure at a certain point because it wasn't who I was. But I mean, of course I learned technique. I learned that they have, the gift is the uh, the technical aspect. That's the, 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 cons, the, the construct is the, the technical aspect, but why I make the art is different than what traditionally how Western European people think about making art and it's about community it's about it's about not just me it's about my community I'm connecting to my community I'm not my individual expression I'm connecting to my community whether it's an indigenous community or a spiritual community I'm connecting yeah I know I I, I... I absolutely see that. I, I think we have some questions, I think. Um, um, I think Tara or Tara, I, I don't know if it's Tara or Tara Jefferson. Um, Hi. I'd love to hear from you. I know you've had a few comments and, and questions. Would you like to ask them of Nadima? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, like I said, I, I logged in a few minutes late, so I apologize if this is already answered. Um, but um, a question and a comment. Um, question, where can I see your pieces live and in person? Are they in a particular exhibition right now or in a particular space where we can see that? And two, I really appreciate um, your art and your artistic expression because like um, our narrator, um, I'm sorry, like your name, <laughs> mentioned that the divine feminine and feminine energy Usually in indigenous um, cultures, not only in this continent, but in Africa and Asia, it's more valued and more celebrated. Um, and it's not something just through the male gaze. It's like, oh, this woman is beautiful because no, within and within herself, understanding that connection with your culture and with your people, your strength is in your women. And having that value is kind of lost in, uh, in Western based cultures. So those are my comments and my question. And I, I really don't have any work uh, at, on exhibit except right now at uh, a show called Chaganolo San, which is in um, in Maine. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> actually, what part of Maine? <laughs> here's, the, uh, 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 here's the image of the work that's there as a cube, and please show it as a cross. Um, this is a um, a map of the uh, of the heavens. Uh, and it represents the four colors of humanity again, and at the center, the, the, the celestial orb, um, and it relates, and the reason why it's in that show is because I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, and um, this work is representing um, uh, a personage of the Baha'i faith, and um, who was uh, sort of a grandfather image, um, and it will be on view, okay, Thank you, Josefina, for reminding me that this piece will be on view on November 20th at the New York Baha'i Center. So if you want to see that work, um, you can see that. I would really like to go uh, through the images just without talking 
or just talking through so that everyone can see my body of work um, because I, it's, I kind, kind of, they, you know, I kind of need to do that. The gallery is at 53 East 11th Street uh, uh, between University Place and Broadway. So that, that will be on exhibit just for that one day. And here are some images of the Yellow Day Moon. Um, and uh, the next pieces uh, are parflesh jingles based on the art of indigenous women. Because um, our people, the women make art that's more abstract. It's more about cosmic symbols and the men make um, symbols of, of life and chronology. And the next piece is um, called um, Lupe in the Sky with Diamonds, sort of based on Guadal um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, but this is Lupe, the Guadalupe in the Sky with Diamonds. And then the next uh, series is uh, our parfleche boxes and parfleches are designs that women do in the prairies. That's traditional Lakota women and other Plains women. And this one is based on um, Russian nesting dolls. So, and the four colors, of humanity and uh, Father Sky and Mother Earth are included. And then this one, the next one, which is uh, six feet diameter is called Mitakuye Oyasin. In Lakota, that means we are all related. And it represents the four sacred colors and it represents healing with the jingle uh, around the, 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 the circumference. And I just want to say when George Floyd died, the Native American jingle dress dancers, the women went and danced at the site where he died because the jingle dress is a, is a healing dress. So these same jingles represent that healing and, um, and the four sacred colors and the, 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 four, the, you know, the four perspectives, you know, this perspective of the eagle who's in the sky and the mouse they have the the world they see the world in two different ways and so we have to respect everyone's vision so that's what that's about because at the center you have a bear a buffalo an eagle and a mouse and they all have different visions the next piece uh, uh is the um the four lakota virtues that represent uh the male and the female are depicted um as virtues. The two female virtues are wisdom and generosity. The two male virtues are, 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 are um, fortitude and, and bravery. And then the male are depicted with the gold halo and the, the silver halos represent the moon and the female. And it's kind of influenced by the Buddhist tankas, but we don't have faces traditionally on our dolls. So I just made it faceless. But someone saw that and said it was like a look like spirits to them. So I keep it on my Facebook page to protect me. Um, and then uh, and I've been working uh, recently on a billboard um, for uh, a Native American uh, uh, group, uh, advocate group, and they're advocating land back to the tribes because so much of our land was stolen and you know, through trickery and all kinds of murder and stuff. Uh, so um, here we have all the little embryos of the four sacred colors and, um, and my, my message is earth is our mother and water is life and, and, and earth, you know, we all have one mother. We all, we all relate it. We all come from the same mother and we have to, you know, get it together. And then the sky has the, it represents uh, 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 time and space. Uh, four represents space and three represents time. So it represents time and space. And then the water is the blue band where it is written, earth is our mother and water is, uh, is life. And then um, I don't know if we, we must, did we get to see all my works, um, Michelle? Oh yeah, we actually pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, much. We, I mean, I think we, I think we saw. A yeah, second. I think we, you know, oh, we, oh. pretty much. The last thing I want to talk about is what I'm working on right now. Uh, these are uh, 
this is a plan. This is not the final work. This is just a canvas, but it's called Hoop Dreams. And uh, it's Black Elk's vision of the hoops of many hoops of humanity. And he was this uh, holy man that saw the future. And he saw all the different people, all the different people of the world as hoops. And they were all together in one hoop. So um, I took that inspiration and I'm creating these hoop dreams and, uh, and they will be configured so that at the center is the four hoops uh, and they'll represent the birth of humanity. And then in each direction are the, are the different colors of the hoops. And uh, for the South at the bottom, which is yellow would be the, would represent the, the directions. There's an extra hoop, there's like a cross and then one extra hoop that represents the direction. And then within each group will be the gifts of each groups of those humanities. And that they're all, you know, they all have some special beauty. Um, and that we should respect the differences also. Not everybody, you know, we're not all this, you know, we have, we all have unit, we should have unity. That doesn't make mean that we have to make people all the same, it's different. Uniformity is when you make people all the same. Unity is when you have uh, people together, no matter how different they are. So that's my dream. My next work, a circle of, of uh, you know, circles upon circles. That, that's such a, a wonderful idea. You know, that notion of unity versus uniformity. I, I love that as just a, a theme of your work and 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 sort of of your of your mission. We, um, this has really been extraordinary. Um, it, it's been so fascinating to listen to you. There've been so many wonderful comments. I hope you'll take a minute to read them in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and a, as is our tradition, we are sort of nearing the end of our program tonight. <clears throat> as is our tradition, we like to do a sort of rapid fire question series with you. So if you will indulge us, of course. <clears throat> Sorry. I know it's very overwhelming. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. It's okay. You can be overwhelmed. Here we go. Here's my first question. What is your favorite artist or artwork or art movement? That's very hard. That's very hard. Um, I can say what artists, I don't know if they're my favorite, whatever, but uh, I, I was like, when I was an art student, I was crazy in lo love with Edward Monk because he had this aspect of his work that was transcendental. I mean, it just wasn't, the, there was something going on there that was deep. And I actually went to Norway, to Oslo. Um, I liked George O'Keefe as a teacher, but I wouldn't, you know, someone once said to me, oh, you know, like, uh, uh, I, you're like the Native American Judy Chicago. And I said, no, I'm not. Because Judy Chicago didn't go past the vagina and I'm about birth. So um, it, it was just different, you know? And, um, but uh, you know who blows me away is um, T.C. Cannon. Uh, T.C. Cannon was a Native American artist. And if, I, if he was alive, I would have been in love with him. <laughs> He was, I fell in love with him when I saw his art. He, he really was in touch with that spiritual aspect. Um, and he was able to take the worlds, the two worlds and bring them together. A world of very sophisticated, knowledgeable, worldly person that was able to translate some profound ceremonial information in his artwork. And people that are, uh, people that are 
uh, that that kind of are familiar with traditions of native peoples in the prairie can really relate to his work. And I really related to his work in terms of him being able to fuse those two worlds together. He really was a mind blower for me. I mean, it was just like, psh, I, it just, just made, just made, and, and I think the teacher, one of my most profound teachers was Paul Clay, because mm -hmm. I remember going to see his show at, at the Guggenheim and it was just like a crash course in color theory. I mean, there were colors that were in his work that I had never seen before. And it was just like, it, it just took me to another level. Um, I think that he, um, he really touched, uh, touched me in a way that really educated me so strongly. And I also love the work of Milton Avery. Mm -hmm. um, it was just very soft and mellow and simplified, but it just really um, caught my eye over the years. I'm just trying to think. There's so many artists. It's such a that, difficult question. Yeah, right? it's so many. And of course, Gauguin, you know, because I would go into galleries and the gallery director said, oh, you look like a Gauguin girl, you know? And I said, yeah, I can really relate to those feet. Those women had the square feet because I have like square Indian feet. So I says, I can really relate to those women. But I just love that they were brown women and that that they were painting brown people, you know. And I, that course, was that Dan was, was very problematic in his own right. Um, yeah, you know, well, yeah, he, yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, he was. Right. And we, you know. We know that, but I, at the time I it was a, a, a child, you know, I didn't sure. know that, you know. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that's true. That right? was, Some, uh, yeah. yeah, we respond and, and, to artists. But you know what, Nuria? He was, he was, his mother was from Peru, so he had indigenous roots. <clears throat> and I felt like that man was painting colors that no European artist was painting. And I think that people from different parts of the world have a color uh, frequency that they, that they connect with. And um, I felt like his indigenousness came through, um, his indigenous roots came through his work. And actually his profile kind of looked Inca, but because um, I, I saw his work and it was this girl that was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was from Peru and she had a very Inca face and I said man you know you look like you could be related to Gauguin because you had that same profile so yeah I think there was a lot not said about his indigenous ancestry and I connected with him on that level there are so many people there's so many artists that influenced me and uh, uh, um, uh, there was this woman from Canada Sh uh, Shirley Bear um, and she she was a, an artist, and she and she was like sort of my men one of my mentors as an artist and as a native indigenous woman. So there were so many re different reasons why these artists influenced me, and but you know, it's just really um, yeah, it's, I, very, I, it's it's really hard to get it all in an hour. It's so difficult, know? right? No, yeah. I know. All right, so I'm going to make it even more difficult now because I'm going to ask you to describe yourself in three words. Because we don't do anything easy on this show. Three words. Survivor. Okay. Warrior. Okay. Mother. Okay. Well done. Well done. Okay. Here's another question. I've got two more for you. This is the next one. What historical figure or which historical figure do, do you identify with? You, you, you very much look to the past and you look to your ancestry and you look to, um, you know, is there a historical figure that you identify with? 
Not really. <laughs> I identify with cosmic mothers, honey. I love that. Okay. That's a good. I that's... identify with them. I don't identify with an individual, you know, because what can be higher than, you know, that a uh, cosmic mother. But, you know, and that's perfect because in a way, you know, I would say that, you know, when, you know, in, in the Western tradition, typically when you see, you know, a figure of a man, the question is, who is that, right? In, when you see a, an image of a woman, uh, an allegorical image, you ask, what does she represent? Right. Right. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, there, there's a real distinction there. So I completely understand that response, right? It's this sort of universal cosmic uh, answer. And, and, and I think that, that that makes a lot of sense given your body of work and, and, and understanding um, that idea. So I, 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 I understand that. All right, here's your final question. This is sort of a Noma tradition here. You're having a dinner party. You have three guests that you could invite, dead or alive, real, fictional, cosmic or otherwise. Who would you have at this dinner party? If they were alive or dead? Whatever you want. It's okay. your, it's well, one of them, party. as you know already, I'm I said TC Cannon, you know, would have been invited. Okay, you know? I like that. We'll take that. Um, uh, and they have to be human beings. It, it, no, I, I think you it's your dinner party. You can do whatever you want. All right, let me see. I don't know. That would be a hard one. That would really be a hard one. I'd like to invite Sophia Loren because I adore her. Huh. Okay. She was uh, one of my, you know, I just adored her when she was, she's, she's an artist. Yeah, she's I like an that. artist. I like that. So uh, let's see, who else, who else, who else, who else? I don't know. Not too many people get me thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> the older I get, the less thrilled I get. But anyway, let me think now. Let me think. Let me think. Well, you know, I would have liked to have actually gotten to know um, a figure in our history, in, in my history, my family's history is, is, is uh, Matoka. Matoka, AKA Pocahontas. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. Um, that 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 sounds like quite the dinner party. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'd like to be there, just like you <laughs> fly in the wall, and they can serve dinner for you. Um, well, you know, she was a fascinating young oh, woman. Oh yes, mm -hmm. she was an entrepreneur. She was a uh, a medicine woman. Uh, you know, and. <clears throat> According to our family, she was one of my ancestors. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Um, you know, they used to tell me that when I was a kid, but I would like make like they didn't say it. I would be embarrassed. And my grandmother's sister says, we're not Cherokee. We're Pocahontas Indian. I'm not going to school and telling anybody that because, you know, and then I found out through my historical research <laughs> that um, my great grandfather was a Randolph. And that the Randolph oh, family yeah. was one of the descendants of Pocahontas' marriage with John Rolfe. That's right. So um, I was like, oh, my God, it's really true. But, uh, yeah, I thought she was, you know, she's one of my heroes. But, of course, they, she was 20 or 21 when she died, you know. She, yeah. Yeah. No, she that, did a lot. That, no it, that, that certainly sounds like someone that would be a good person to have at your dinner party. And you know what's really sad? Children think she's a Disney character. I know, I know. That's really sad. She's the only Disney character that was a real person. Hmm, yeah, no, it's true. No, and, and you know, she, she occupies a, you know, also, you know, 
it's a it's a complicated um, history. She Malinche, you know, from um, Cortez and and these also these other figures. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. That that's a that that would be a very good dinner party, I think. Very interesting, at least. I don't know how well, it would go. You know, I would like to. Uh, uh, you know, we always have four, so uh, four is an Indian number. So I'd like to invite Dear Woman. Okay. Do you know about her? Tell me. Tell us a little bit about her. Um. Well, you know what? I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you research her. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's that's for for our next because she's Nova. misunderstood you know she's misunderstood by in the western construct as a monster but she wreaks havoc on men who misbehave by turning into a deer and stomping them to death um but it's just really you know it's it's something that really has to be understood in the context of the culture but it's, it's, you know, they made a horror movie about her. But, yeah. And well, I don't know if you've seen that new show, Reserva Reservation Dogs, but she's a character mm. in the new show, Reservation Dogs on FX, uh, also Hulu download, uh, 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 screen uh, streaming on Hulu. So if you check her out, then you'll understand um, Dear Woman. Frida Kahlo does a painting as a dear woman as well. Yeah, it was, I'm sure it was totally uh, yeah. a, a subconscious mm -hmm. thing yeah. that yeah. Um, that she channeled dear woman. Yeah. Or she needed to channel dear woman, I think at, at a certain yeah. point. Oh yeah. Um, but she it's, does it's, this post uh, Diego divorce. So yeah. there's a whole lot there. I think that's our, that's our uh, Thursdays with Noma part two. I think conversation. So okay. um, <laughs> this has been oh. phenomenal. This has been so interesting. Um, it's been such a joy uh, and 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 so enlightening and illuminating to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, uh, as I said, I feel like there should be a part two, part three uh, of these conversations. Um, I know you have a show uh, coming up or a conversation coming up on November 20th. Yeah, um, that show. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope, um, you know, for those of you who can attend, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It's truly been an honor um, and a pleasure for all of us. And thanks to all of you uh, for sharing this evening with us. Um, and, and before we go uh, tonight, I wanted to uh, turn uh, the mic over to Martin, who I think has a few kind of closing remarks for us. Uh, Martin, would you like to jump in here? Sure. Thank you, Daria. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. The Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance Technical Assistance Workshops continue with Michael Palma and Grant Writing for Artists at 6.30 p.m. Monday, November 15th. Please RSVP on our website. In December, we have workshops on best practices for artists' website and on producing and editing a standout highlight reel. We also have two healing art workshops, collective care art and reflecting back and looking forward. See nomanyc.org for details. Thursdays with Noma will resume at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, December 2nd with artists Takashi Harada and Kei Soto. We invite you to join us on Thursday, December 2nd at 7.30. Finally, please read the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance newsletter for artists' opportunities, exhibitions, events, and to calendar your own events, all on our website, nomanyc.org. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here, Nadima. It was truly a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you for sharing your work um, and your, your process and everything with us this evening. Um, it's truly been an extraordinary night. Thanks everybody. Um, we will see you in December. Um, have a good weekend, have a good rest of your month. Thank you.